What's up, buddy? What's up, dude? How are you? Man, I'm doing great, buddy. Man, I was great. sitting there in the hole, on hold getting pumped up, about to do some pull-ups. Dude, tell me about what you said about when you wanted to break somebody's will, you ran through them versus when you just wanted to beat them. Well, well, and it's something that you should always think about. Like, I try to tell young guys, listen, how often are you going to play this dude? Like, like yeah. if I say the guy's in the NFC East, I'm going to see you twice a year. And he's trying to play physical. I was, I, I, and he's a big guy trying to play physical. I can probably go around him. But since I'm going to see him twice a year, I want to run through him. You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? I, I, so I would attack his weakness if I want to beat him. I attack his strength if I want to break him. When someone attacks your strength and beats you with attacking your strength, you got nowhere to go. You see, when I attack his weakness, he said, oh, he, he beat me on that, he beat me on that. But, uh, but okay, I'm going to just get physical with him now. I'm going to start being physical. But if I come out and I attack that strength, bam, 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 and I'm physical with you, now you're sitting there saying, oh, my God. Coach, I don't want to see this dude. And not just the game we play in. You're going to be thinking about seeing me next the next time we play if you're in my division. So I always took that to note. And that's Everson Walls, you said, who led the, the NFL in interceptions. Everson Walls was the best in the world. He talked really? a lot about that, too, because early on, when I got in the league, I remember the first time I went one-on-one -on -one with Everson Walls. He came up. He acted like he was going to jam me. Then started walking off, came back, and then he jammed me. I fell to the ground. And that's when somebody said, why are you trying to run around him? Just go through him. Just go through him. And that started that. That's where I started breaking down, running through people and, and, and not taking the time to run around people. I'm not Tyreek Hill. I'm not Julio Jones. I don't have that kind of speed. I don't have the time to wait. I got to go through you to get to that point. <laughs> I got to go old school on in. I know we got limited time, so I'm going to throw some rapid fire stuff at you. And you're the playmaker, so I know you can catch these and run with it, right? Um, Absolutely. Who wins in a fight between Eric Williams and Mark Tuane? Oh, that's a good one right there. Oh, uh, bad dudes, that's bad a dudes. Question right there, because Tuane is a bad Samoan from Hawaii. You know <laughs> what I mean? But Big E's a nasty mug. Man. He's a nasty mug. Right. I, I, I wouldn't know who would win that fight. As long, hey. All I know is I wouldn't fight either one of them. <laughs> it's called self-preservation. It's a business decision. Right. <laughs> who, who was the toughest dude on those 90s Cowboys teams? And you can say yourself, too, because I know you're up there. I, you know, we, we've had a lot of tough guys on those teams. I'm going to tell you one of the guys that you will underestimate his toughness, but make no mistakes about it. He's a tough dude. Charles Hayden. Charles Hayes, not oh, a big yeah. in the world. Not, 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 not them, not, but boy, I'm talking about, he's a monster, man. Eric Williams had got that knee operation, and Charles said, I'll tell you when you're ready to play. And then a year later, when he came back from that knee operation, he was coming on the practice field. And Charles Haley said, he's not ready until we say he's ready. I'm telling you right now. They lined up, we called the whole team over. They lined Charles Haley and Eric Williams up. And Troy said, Blue 18, Blue 18 said, huh. And these two men came together. I've never seen anything like that in my life. Charles Haley leaned into Eric Williams. It was a loud, it went everywhere. You heard the collision. And then they both stood up and looked at each other. And Charles said, he's ready. And we went <laughs> crazy. You know what I mean? Charles Haley. <laughs> What, what, what's, what's All right, Charles. Is it weird for you to watch games and see a number eighty-eight running around out there with a Cowboys jersey on? I, I, I actually, it's not weird. I love it. I get people ask me that all the time. Why won't you retire your number? I said, let me break this down. Let me tell you, because Drew Pearson broke it down for me. Yeah. I said, Drew. When they gave me the numbers, you said, I said, Drew, I I, I, I don't want to do this. He said, no. He said, wear it. But don't just wear it. He said, make my ceiling your floor. Step on what I did and go do more. I was like, wow. And he said to me then that I thought about, and I tell people now, he said, Michael, if they retire it, it goes in the raffle. And only, only time we see that number 
is when I leave time and go to eternity, and then that's all we lost you, Pearson. Back to the game. But what you wearing it every time you make a play, I get my flowers. I'm like, you're right. So now, every time CD Lamb or, or Dez Bryant made a play, yeah. I get my flowers. They said that look like Mike Irvin. If they drop a ball, I get my flowers because they said Mike Irvin wouldn't have dropped that. I want that <laughs> number on somebody back. So every Sunday, I get my flowers. I don't have to wait till I go to eternity. I can get my flowers while I'm here in time. Were you on the practice field that day that Jimmy Johnson said the asthma field's over there? Did you hear that? I, I did. I was on the practice field. I was on the practice field. <laughs> did you laugh? Or were you like, oh, shit? <laughs> no, no, no. You didn't laugh. You were serious no. with Jimmy. I tell you what shocked me, though, though. Let me tell you what shocked me. What tripped me out. To learn years later, years later, that Jimmy had asthma. Really? Jimmy had asthma. Yes! I'm like, Coach, how you kicking that man off for half an ass and you had ass? Jimmy, he said, I wasn't playing. I got to make sure who's ever playing that he's ready to play. So, yeah, that, that, I, I was there. I, I was. Yeah, I came in one day. Me and another player went out on a Thursday night. We always went out Thursday night together. We go out to eat, and then we went out. We came in the next day, and we were late to meet him. We walking in the same time. Jimmy stopped us at the door. Michael, you're my leader. I'm so disappointed you beat your butt and then you sit out in that chair and you be a leader. And then he looked at the other player and said, you, you get your butt in there, you get your pants and you get the hell out. He fired him on the spot, on the spot. That's the kind of thing that Jimmy would do. So whenever you're around Jimmy, you always on your P's and Q's and ready to play. What's the biggest similarity between him and Barry Switzer? Both are great men. They just went about things differently. Jimmy believed that I have to press and keep you pressed to bring the best out of you. Barry, who's a great man, wanted to say, listen, I'm paying these guys four, five, six million dollars a year. I don't have to hover over them, you know? But the reality is, yes, you do. Yes, you do, because everybody, isn't as hungry as your top guys. You got to hover over those guys. Emmett, Troy, and I one time went to Coach Johnson and said, hey, Coach, all of these pre-practice speeches you give, because he gave a pre-practice speech every practice. Like, we wow. don't need it, Coach. We're ready to practice. He said to us, I know y'all don't need it. I ain't saying it for y'all. I'm saying it for the 52nd and 53rd man on the roster. You right. just got to endure it, and I won't stop doing it. Man, I'm curious to know, like what you just said about how you attacked Everson Walls and wanted to break somebody. How, how does that translate in your day-to-day -day life? Well, it, 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 it's still the same here. This is what's hard about retirement from football because you got to understand you're not a football player anymore. I, I went to go see my doctor because my knees were bad. And, and my wife went with me. And the doctor said, you got to stop running. Your knees are gone. They're bad. No more running. We left the doctor's office. Well, I came home. I started getting dressed. My wife said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going running. She said, didn't you hear the doctor? I said, baby, <laughs> those, those are recommendations. That he has right, to right. Because he gives those <laughs> to regular people. I'm not regular. That's He's right. just giving a regular record. I, 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 so, so, so I always think I can work through it. I can just keep going, go through it. And it's not that way. You're an old man now. You got to start it. Right, right. Like, when my eyes went bad, yeah. when, when I hit 40, my eyes went bad, I'm thinking, I can just shake it. I can fix this. I can do it. Don't worry. I can... No, no, no. You can't. You can't. It's not a football thing. You got to go to a doctor. I went to the doctor. The doctor gave me an examination. He said, oh, yeah, this is Prestiopia. I said, what is that? That's what happens at about age 40 <laughs> when you start waking up and, and you look down the paper and it looks like spots, not letter. That's presbyopia. And and, and, and then, and, and, and we, he, he recommended the number one, the number one progressive lens. That's what I went. Changed my life. I needed to know that. 
I couldn't fix my own eyes. I couldn't get them right. But as a football player, I think I can. I want to until I went to that doctor and got it right. So I'm saying, if anybody's having eye trouble, get to your doctor. Stop trying to fix it yourself. Go get your presbyopia taken care of the right way and ask your doctor about the number one progressive lens in the world, Verilux. Right. Uh, last question. I know we got to get out of here. Uh, favorite play of your career? When Michael Irvin lays his head on the pillow at night and thinks about his life and thinks about his playing career, what gets you the most stoked? What What is the play that you go back to? Well, well obviously, when I was a kid, I used to throw rocks in the neighborhood and there were people coming to my mom's house. I was like, Yo, son, broke the window. Yo, son, he's not ever going to be anything. You know, messing with it. It's like, so, so then when I got in the NFL and I scored that first touchdown as an eight route in the Super Bowl 27, all I thought about was all those people that knocked on my mom's door and said I wouldn't amount to anything. I said, they all just saw me score a touchdown in the <laughs> Super Bowl. And then I came back 18 seconds later and caught that other touchdown where I threw my leg up, spent around, and dove in. Yes. It was the greatest moment in my life. I had dreamed about catching those touchdowns in the Super Bowl since I could barely walk and to actually have that thing happen. That was that was absolutely great.